Welcome to Lions Radio Network, where the show takes you on a roaring adventure with entertaining and stimulating topics focusing on entertainment, sports, business, world news, along with many other topics. Whatever your interests are, you will find them right here on Lions Radio Network. The freedoms that Americans enjoy are not free and can be attributed to the dedicated service and the blood, sweat, and tears of many generations of our nation's military. The Military Hour is dedicated to the servicemen and women, veterans, and their families that have made the sacrifice to defend our Constitution and country. Military service is being part of something that is greater than yourself. General Joseph Dunford, 19th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And now, it's the Military Hour with your host, Donna Lyon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Military Hour. I'm your host, Donna Lyons, coming to you live from Washington, D.C., right here on the Lions Radio Network. And he's here. He is here, the first ladies' man. Yep, Andrew Oak. He is here. He's the author of Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies, Volume 1 and 2. He's an award-winning television and multimedia producer who has traveled the world with his pen, paper, and camera. A radio, television, and film graduate from the University of Maryland, Andrew has been a storyteller, musician, and entertainer from a young age. He enjoys the art of communication and will go anywhere in the world for more knowledge, greater understanding, and amazing stories. He is a true documentarian of life. Andrew, welcome to the show. Donna, it's fantastic to be here with you today. Been looking forward to this for some time now. This is so much fun. I know we had to reschedule because my schedule got a little bit crazy. So I'm so thankful that you could be here today. And I've told people a little bit about you, but um, let's talk about how you got into this project. Tell us about the project and how it started. Sure, certainly. Um, I I grew up in and around Washington, D.C. The Smithsonian has always been my playground. I've touched the moon rock at the Air and Space Museum more times than I know, and the Kennedy Center was where we went for concerts and the zoo and just all the things that this great capital in this great country affords us. But, you know, when you're here, you kind of take that for granted, especially as a kid. And, and as I got older and started to do documentaries and TV and travel the world, I realized that some of the greatest stories were right here in my own backyard. So when a friend of mine at C-SPAN told me about the project, First Ladies, I was very intrigued. Not because I had a particular interest in the First Ladies, not because I was a government and politics major, not because I'd taken certain classes in school. It was just – it was another story that not many people knew that needed to be told. So this idea that C-SPAN had to to follow up their their series that they did on the presidents was right up my alley, and when they handed me a a, a phone book-sized uh, 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 book of, of all the first ladies uh, and seven bags of gear and said go out and bring us back stories that we can supplement into these full 90 minute shows for every first lady I, I was just I was thrilled it gave me a chance to get out see America learn about these women that, that we really I mean we know who first ladies are when I say first lady you could be thinking of Nancy Reagan someone else is thinking about Jacqueline Kennedy I'm thinking about Martha Washington you know everyone knows a first lady but we don't know all of these first ladies in fact few people do and few people could name them or know what they're about and when I started to find out how influential, how important, what partners in leadership these great women were, these unelected, unpaid women, my interest in them and my love for them went far beyond the series and turned into these books and these speaking uh, uh, events and book signing and and historical events and and speaking at the Smithsonian, Colonial Williamsburg, presidential libraries, museums, and everyone is amazed, and I'm amazed at the interest that these people have in these women once they find out a little bit about a few of them. And it's very inspiring to me to know that I'm inspiring this type of thirst for knowledge and understanding of these great women in other people. 
Right. And how how long was this journey of yours fr- from the beginning from C-SPAN until now? How long has this journey been for you? Well, that's a, that's an excellent question. The the whole thing was was very quick uh, it, for the series. I, I was I was signed on to the C-SPAN project in October of 2012 and given that 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 phone book sized uh, book of first ladies and said, start reading, start researching and hit the road. And it wasn't even a month before I was out on the road, interviewing, traveling, getting B-roll locations, discovering uh, private homes and collections. And, and that was only setting up the series that would start in February of 2012 or 2013 rather. So there's only a couple months to get started. And then as the show was going, I was still traveling. So I traveled for a year and about two months for the series, and that was with seven bags of gear by myself, pinballing across the U.S. to hit every single location I could, bring the material back. There were other producers back in Washington, wonderful, wonderful team of people, but out on the road, I was by myself. I had to drive myself, carry my own gear, set up the lights, set up the microphone, press record, have the information, conduct the interviews, get the B-roll, bring everything back. I was also booking guests uh, for the live show, and um, it was a it was a real it was a sprint and a marathon at the same time, and, and and it was truly truly remarkable. And the series ran consecutively with my travel from President's Day of 2013 to President's Day 2014, and by the uh, by the middle of 2015, I was already speaking. And then my book came out, my first book came out in 2016, and my second book came out in 2017. So I, I don't think I've sat down since uh, maybe uh, summer of 2012. <laughs> That's just crazy. So I have to, before I go into a lot of questions about the First Ladies, I have to ask you how you came up with the name, First Ladies Man. <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, people people get it. It's fun. It's cheeky. It, it, I this love is a way it. For me, oh, thank you very much. Uh, it, this is a way for me to be political without being political. To discuss politics without the rancor and the, the, the you know the, the the bipartisan and the and the bickering and the yelling across the aisle. Because again, these women aren't uh, appointed. They aren't elected. They aren't paid. So it's a very uh, not safe place. It's a very, it's a very pleasant place. It's a pleasant place to be in and around Washington, and and that was kind of what 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 inspired the name. I would go to all these locations, and you figure you're going to places where people have worked for a long time, or or you know there's a, there's a woman I I know who works at Wheatland, the home of James Buchanan in in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and she works there because Harriet Lane. Buchanan's niece and first lady, uh, 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 official White House hostess, was an inspiration to her as a little girl growing up in that area. So these people know their locations very, very well. But we always focus on the presidents, and I understand that. And even to a certain extent, when we study the women, we only focus on their time in the White House. We forget that they are young girls. They are young women. They are mothers. They are sisters. They are aunts their girlfriends, then their wives, then their grandmothers, then their widows. I mean, they have lives. They're real people outside of this White House and outside of this four or eight years. So I was going to Colonial Williamsburg in November of 2012, and I had to keep reminding people along the way, like, hey, look, this is all about the ladies. We've heard plenty about the guys. I said, I'm I'm here for the ladies. Uh, Think of me as, as your ladies' man. So, you know, it just kind of developed and stuck on its own, and then, and then pretty soon people were calling me the first ladies' man, and next thing you know, I got the, the T-shirts and the trademark and the website and the books, and everywhere I go, people, people get it, and, and people get the cheekiness, but, but also with a nod of respect, and, and, and the fact that, you know, look, my, my nana, my mom's mom taught me that, that all girls are women – but not all women are ladies, and that is a very respectable uh, 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 term in, in my world. And when I say I'm the ladies' man, that is out of nothing but respect and, and the, the admiration for these great women. Yeah, very true. And if people would read the books, they would understand that. And, and go to the website, too, uh, first ladiesman.com and they can actually see some of the videos and the T-shirts and the books are there. So just a quick reminder. Now, Obviously, they, the First Ladies influence us in some way or another. 
who do you think was the most influential to the United States and, and other countries? If you could pick one, who do you think was the most influential? Well, Do- Donna, that, that's an excellent question. And it's, it's not even something I realized until I was writing my second book, Volume 2. I should explain. Volume 1 is Martha Washington through Ida McKinley, so the 1700s and 1800s. Volume right. 2 picks up with Edith Roosevelt, the first first lady of the 20th century, and goes all the way through to Melania Trump. I was, I was able to hold publishing of the book until I could at least get some words – down on paper about Melania and what my thoughts were up to that to that point. And keep in mind that you know the Obamas don't even have their their presidential library open, so there's still so much more work to do here. But when I was writing Volume Two, it dawned on me the most influential first lady on the modern world globally, not just the United States. And this, I would even venture to say, and I do, that she's the most influential first lady past present or future for Hmm. the impact that she has had on every single human being on planet earth. And do you have, take, take a, take a stab at who you think that might be. And there's really, there's no wrong answer because this is just my opinion, but you'll, you'll hear my, 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 my reasons. But, but, you know, I, I ask this from my live audiences and I get fantastic uh, guesses and I get right guesses and wrong guesses, you know, and, and, and different reasons. But, but who, who would you think that would be? Well, you know, I have my favorites. So I'd have to say like, if I was to pick one, I would probably say sure. Nancy Reagan or Barbara Bush, but I, now okay. I know there's so many others. So um, I would love to hear yours. <laughs> those, those are, those are, those are, those are good guesses. And we can talk about both uh, uh, Barbara and Laura Bush. I have some very, very, very uh, uh, unique thoughts about, about each of them. But my pick for the most influential first lady, past, present, or future, is Betty Ford. Mm, interesting. I would uh, Tell us why. And here's why, exactly. Betty Ford did things that were not done for two things that either indirectly or directly – affect every human being on earth and those two things are cancer and addiction Mm. there's no human being on planet earth that i know have read or met or seen that has not escaped that in their life in one way shape or form and betty ford tackled both of those issues publicly in a in a in an arena that did not discuss these things I mean, we're still having the problems with, and you talk, you know, Nancy Reagan was right there with the just say no. And, 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 and and with, 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 with what so many of these first ladies have done with medical wings of hospitals and things. And that goes all the way back to Harriet Lane that we talked about. Harriet Lane is the reason we have the, the very, very, I mean, internationally known children's wing of the Johns Hopkins Medical Center in Baltimore. That started with Harriet Lane, President Buchanan's niece. But, but what Betty Ford did for, for breast cancer, I mean, there weren't, there weren't 5Ks. There weren't Avon walks. There weren't any of these things before her. Addiction, people that had the, the money and the wherewithal would take their addicted family members and stick them in mental institutions. And the ones that right. didn't have the money, they became homeless and stuck them out on the street. Betty Ford brought all of this to the stage, did it with elegance, grace, and a candor, which is yet to be uh, duplicated. I mean, the, the Adamses. President and Mrs. John Adams, their daughter had a mastectomy in the 1800s. We, we did not wow. in the modern world invent cancer. We did not invent addiction. But the way people that have dealt with it, the way the modern world has dealt with it throughout time before Betty Ford, she changed everything. 100%. And you are so right. And, and we forget about that. We do. It's really important for now, people now, to remember, especially now with the opiate addiction and everything going on now. You're right. She did pave away. 100%. And that's very well, important. You, you go back. Eleanor Roosevelt was walked down the aisle by her – when she married her sixth cousin, FDR, when Eleanor Roosevelt married Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Eleanor was walked down the aisle by her uncle, then President Theodore Roosevelt. And the reason she was walked down the aisle by her uncle – was because her father had died from injuries jumping out of an insane asylum because of alcohol and, and opioid addiction. 
Wow. I mean, it, it, it just it, the, the, the history of this goes back so far, and it's so intertwined. But here's even the more remarkable thing about Betty Ford. Betty Ford should have never been first lady. And this is what I really discovered researching my book as I was going back and looking at 60 Minutes interviews because I was getting to the point that Betty Ford did so much. I mean, she was a remarkable woman even without the, the, the cancer and the addiction stuff. She spoke out against uh, uh, things that did not help her husband professionally and politically. She was not a quiet woman. She was an ERA advocate and a women's rights advocate. And she stood up and said, you know, if, if they don't want me in the White House, they can throw me out. But here's the thing. Her <laughs> husband was never elected to any position that got him into the White House. He was appointed vice president when Agnew right. resigned. He was appointed right. president when Nixon is resigned. So right. her husband, and then you've got to keep in mind that these women, again, are not elected and they are not paid. There's no First Ladies 101. There's no training for this. There's no job description for this. These women become the most powerful and influential unpaid and unelected women in the world because they fell in love with some guy that thought, hey, I got an idea. I'm going to run for president. And on top of that, they would then have to win the presidency. And then this woman slides into the role, which increasingly day by day, year by year, election of election is so highly criticized and critiqued. Uh, that it, it's 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 beyond comprehension what these women go through for the for the good of 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 of, of their country and and their beliefs. It's true. I I sit back and I see some of the posts on Facebook and social media about uh, Melania or even uh, Michelle Obama when she was in, and it's just it it's sickening actually that they get so pinned on stuff. And people just can't see the good things that they're doing. And, um, yeah, that, you're right. They do go through a lot. Now, did you have a favorite after all this stuff I, you've I do, you've but, been but you know what? I want, I, want to pick, I want to piggyback on your comment right there that you said, which is, which is remarkably insightful. Michelle Obama and Melania Trump are the first social media first ladies. Oh, that's track. interesting. That's true. I've been in the news, and I've been in Washington, D.C., and being on planet Earth uh, and, and, and an American citizen for long enough. I know that Laura Bush was probably, in my opinion and estimation and data and research, the last first lady where her husband was uh, – uh, people, people loved him or hated him. You know, it was just yes. President Bush was for, – for what was going on, the element and, – and not for anything – that he did or didn't do, just the way the 24-hour news cycle develops and the way we want our news now, we want immediate uh, you know, results and, and everything and, and other staying out of politics. But Laura Bush, their, her poll numbers didn't reflect it. You can't, you can't find many people that, is gonna, that are going to say anything bad about Laura Bush. She's delightful. But the very next election, and social media is in full swing, the very next administration, and people are saying, Horrible, horrible, disgusting things about our first lady. Yep. And, and social media is that unchecked, unregulated, protected platform where people can say anything they want and people will believe it. People can Absolutely. put stuff on Wikipedia and Facebook and, and all over the Internet and have their blogs and have their posts. And, I mean, look now how easy it is to communicate. I'm, I'm sitting in my office at home talking on the phone, and we're reaching all your viewers. I mean, luckily, you and I are good people. We're responsible people, and we back our things up with, with research and fact. And when it's opinion, I let you know this is my opinion, as we just did right. with Betty Ford. But there is a world of millions of people that get to say whatever they want about these women, and people climb on board these bandwagons of, of just destruction, in, in my opinion. It, it's horrible what pe it's cyberbullying it ki our kids are involved in it our schools are involved you have to put blocks on things and this goes back to my space and every other space and 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 website you know that, that gets that gets thrown into this funnel of social media where where it's just i mean people are looking for bad things to say about people and it's it's horrible it is. It really is. And it's sad because it does affect anyone that's involved with it. So it's pretty sad. Now, I have another one. Who do we know the littlest about 
and it would surprise us about them? Well, you know, I can answer both of your questions. The one that I that I that I that I, I wasn't I wasn't skirting the favorite first lady uh, 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 favorite first lady <laughs> question, even though that's an imp- it's an impossible one. I know too much about all of them to pick an absolute favorite. Right. But, but, you no, know, I get I, it. If we're, I, if, we're, yeah. if we're playing the game, would you rather, or you're pinned down, and my life depends on it. You know, getting off a desert island depends on this answer for me. Life itself, I would say Lou Hoover. <laughs> And the reason I say Lou Hoover is because Lou Hoover is one of, if not the most qualified woman ever to live in the White House, and we know almost nothing about her. Not that we don't know things about her through her papers and her writings in West Branch, Iowa, at the Hoover Museum and Library, and there are Hoover scholars that know a lot about her. But the general public as a whole – knows basically nothing about Lou Hoover because the Hoovers were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the Great Depression could not have been caused or cured by any one-man administration, woman, boy, girl, alien, animal. It just – it cannot rest on on one man's shoulders. But the president, you know, they go in with, with, with eyes wide open on that issue. They know that they get blamed or celebrated for a good or bad economy, and it ended up to be the worst economy in the history of the United States, certainly, and possibly the modern world. But what the Hoovers did before and after and even during the White House is so remarkable. And, and they just – they had no PR machine, and they weren't, they weren't braggarts. They were both self-made people. Lou Hoover is the first woman in America to get a geology degree. She graduated from Stanford University where she met Hoover, and when Hoover proposed to her by telegram, he was in Australia mining gold. And he came back to San Francisco. They got married, had a brief little honeymoon stay at a resort there, hopped on a steamer. She was basically married in a flak jacket holding her, her, her steamer trunk, ready to hop on a boat and, and go around the world with her husband. And they lived in the most remarkable places, and they were self-made millionaires in their, in, their, in their 30s, and they're the first administration of now three to not take a salary. I mean, if people during the Great Depression knew on a wide global or, or at least national scale that the Hoovers were not getting paid and a lot of the stuff that was going on, they were paying for themselves out of pocket with no expectation of getting paid back. Their philanthrop- philanthropic endeavors – Go, that, that's an entire book right there. Not just, I mean, it, it's the, the things that they did for Americans and American diplomats and American families living in Europe at the outbreak of World War I, they paid to get Americans to safe houses and safe passage back to the states because the State Department and the U.S. government couldn't get them out fast enough and couldn't fund it. And the Hoovers just wrote check after check after check. And that's we don't know amazing, that. and we I didn't know, know that. that story. I did not know this. A lot of, yeah, I, I did. Look, so much of this stuff. This, this is this goes back to to why I'm the first lady's man. So much of this stuff I didn't know. A majority of this stuff I didn't know. I couldn't have named every first lady before I started this. I mean, I would have done okay. I mean, again, I grew up in Washington D.C. and I can name you know all the presidents, maybe not in order. I mean, I can now, but I mean, you know, (laughs) this was not common knowledge for me. And what I learned about my own state of Maryland, my own national capital of Washington, D.C., and what here's just one example, the cherry blossom trees. Everyone the world over knows the cherry blossom trees. It's a signature of Washington, D.C. It's a festival. It's a tourist destination. It brings revenue to the nation. It brings revenue to the city. it's, It's huge. Helen Taft planted the first cherry blossom tree. I did not know that. And and they come from Japan, right? They came. They did. They did initially. And here's the, here's the incredible story. Initially, Helen Taft, well, Helen Taft and and her husband uh, did a lot of travel in Asia. Uh, He was the governor of the Philippines after General MacArthur, not the one we know in in modern times with the pipe and the sunglasses. Another General MacArthur was kind of mucking things up over there in in the Philippines. And President McKinley at the time said, uh, uh, Willie, go over there and fix the Philippines, and you come back, and I'll put you on the Supreme Court. Because all William Taft wanted to do was was 
be a Supreme Court justice, be a judge. That's what he loved. He loved law. He loved uh, the judicial process, everything. Didn't want anything to do with the presidency. But McKinley says, go fix the Philippines. You come back. You got a seat on the Supreme Court. You're loving life, uh, and, and, and it's a done deal. Well, McKinley got shot and died, and with, with the death of McKinley, so died the deal. And, and then uh, 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 Taft and his family moved back from the Philippines. Anyway, he gets in the White House, which is another remarkable story in its own. But Helen Taft looks down at this at, at our tidal basin, uh, our, 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 our right by the, the Washington Monument in, in our nation's capital, and it's a swamp. It's a muddy roadway mess, and she said, let's, let's spruce this up. So when people come to our country, they see beautiful gardens and, and, and riverside parks like we saw in, in Asia, traveling through Asia. So – she finds a nursery in, Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania that's going to give them the trees. The Japanese heard about this, and they were, were flabbergasted. They said, there's no way you're getting Japanese cherry blossom trees from some nursery in Pennsylvania. We're going to send you some. So they sent a bunch, and they were, and they were very small. They were, they were saplings, and everyone was kind of surprised, but they were also bug infested. There was about 1,200 trees, I think, and they were bug infested. So uh, Taft, President Taft, and his Secretary of the Interior, they're like, "Look, burn them. We can't. We can't have this. You know, we 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 knew enough of invasive and and uh, 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 non-indigenous species and and problems and diseases with plants and animals that we're like, look, just burn this stuff before." A, a plague is, is unleashed on the nation's capital. So they burned them. The Japanese were very embarrassed, obviously, but then they sent twice as many that in, the, in the next year. So we got like 2,500 some trees. And a lot of those original trees, the, the first ones, right, if you're standing at the, at the tidal basin and you look to your right and you see the, mm-hmm. the Jefferson Memorial and you look to the left about 11 o'clock and you see the, white, uh, the uh, uh, Washington Monument, that's where the first ones were planted by Helen Taft and the wife of the Japanese um, ambassador to the U.S. And they were, the U.S. was just coming out, or the, the Japanese were just coming out of the U, uh, Japanese-Russo War, and the Americans were very helpful in that. We had a wonderful relationship. Asian art was all the rage in everyone's homes and in, in theaters and things like that. So it just fit right in. But now these many uh, years, you know, 100 years later, um, we're in 2018 looking back, and most of us would not name Helen Taft if we were naming 20 first ladies. True, true, very true. And I did not know that she planted the first one, and I'm absolutely amazed. I knew the story about them coming from Japan and the bugs and all that. Um, yep, but yep. I did not know that she planted that first one. That is so cool. Yeah. That is just incredible. Okay, so before I let you go, I have another question I want to ask you. Now, I have mine, who I think it is. But who do you think had the best sense of humor? Mm. Because it's hard to tell because a lot of us see them when they're doing in the professional state. You don't get to see them, you know, crack a smile sometimes. And, I mean, there's very few that we've been able to see do that. So, I mean, I have my opinion on who it probably is, but I would love to hear yours, who you think it is. Well, here's, here's the deal. So many of these first ladies could have been funny, but we just didn't have the outlets or the technology or the resources to see how funny they were. Um, you know, every, every instance I see uh, of, of, of Grace Coolidge, she, she lit up a room. She, she, was, she was so entertaining, so engaging, so affable, so friendly, so cheery, and such a, such a yin to Coolidge's silent cows, uh, yang. You know, you could go back and find those women like that. Dolly Madison, I mean, there was no better party to go to than Dolly Madison's party. And I bet you she could tell a joke as she was walking through the room with her little snuff box and her rum punch, which I've seen. I've seen, I've seen her punch bowl set, and I've seen her snuff box. So I speak from, from experience, even, even way back with these women. But in, in modern times, I'm, I'm going to pick two, and the, and the two are for, for specific examples. Number one, I'm going to say Nancy Reagan. And, and, and one of the reasons I think Nancy Reagan is one of the first ladies with the best sense of humor is you look at that Just Say No campaign. And while it's a very serious subject, she knew how to use Hollywood and pop culture in an entertaining way with a little bit of time, she went on different strokes. She went to NBA basketball games. I know that there's a picture of, uh, of Charles Barkley and, and another NBA player 
holding her up, and she was a tiny, tiny little lady, <laughs> holding yeah. her up so she could slam dunk a just say no basketball. Okay, that's not an uptight woman. That that's a woman who who gets it, you know. And and then yeah. there's a very very famous dinner she went to, the Gridiron Dinner, and everyone. And this brings up an interesting topic of what's good for one is not always good for another. And Nancy Reagan walked into that White House and said, "I'm going to restore this place to the elegance of the Kennedy days." And everyone loved Jacqueline Kennedy. That's another woman you cannot find any. You can find very few people to say anything bad about Jacqueline Kennedy, beloved, uh, 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 you know, as much if not more than, than any other first lady. And and then Nancy Reagan comes in and she says, "Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna emulate her," and that's even crossing party lines. I mean, Nancy Reagan was a Republican, Jacqueline Kennedy a Democrat, and she got blasted for it. And people right. said that she was fancy Hollywood and spending too much money, and her clothes were cheap. Well, listen, when a first lady doesn't get new china or doesn't dress well or doesn't have a haircut then they get blasted for that and they say oh you're a hillbilly you don't know what you're doing lucy hayes was <laughs> criticized a lot even though she was loved by 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 so many as well they said hey you know step up your clothes and your and your hair game you're in the big city now lady and she didn't which i have great respect for but anyway nancy reagan was given a lot of grief for for spending too much money being too fancy in this and she came out with a prepared poem that i'm sure she had help with uh and and wearing basically you know thrift store clothes rubber boots uh, a giant floppy hat, <laughs> costume jewelry, uh, uh, pants and shirts that didn't match, and an umbrella. And she, she had a, a, a clever poem written to the emperor's new clothes and, and, and went out and did that. So she could poke fun at herself. But we should not forget and, and, and fail to mention here Michelle Obama. Yep. Michelle Obama is a remarkably engaging, intelligent, and well-educated. I mean, th- there are a lot of first ladies that are intelligent. And then there are first ladies that are well-educated. There are not as many people in the world, let alone first ladies, that are both intelligent and well-educated. And when you see uh, uh, Michelle Obama almost taking a page out of uh, Nancy Reagan's playbook, using pop culture and using that to put the message forward to just say, uh, uh, let's move, and, 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 and the, the, the healthy eating and the childhood obesity. She went on The Biggest Loser. She went on The Tonight Show. She was on The Tonight Show all the time, did skits with Jimmy Fallon. I, I mean, she, she was a very young and vivacious first lady who put that message out there in pop culture, and she could uh, take a poke at herself and always came through with that message, always came through with the message, they go low, we go high. And, and there's really – you know, that's one of the best messages you can put out there in life is no matter. And I think Melania Trump is doing that, is taking a pay. You know, when, when people slam her on, on, on uh, social media and Twitter and, and all over the place, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't fire back. She just – she lets it go. She doesn't get into tweet wars and, and arguments and, or go on TV and say outlandish things. She puts her head down. She goes on to the next event, pops up somewhere where everyone is very surprised. At, at where she's going and what she's doing because she has a genuine care for the well-being of children. And the whole bullying thing, I say, you know, she gets a lot of criticism. And I'm not, I, you know, I, I read it. I know. I try and stay away from it. But people say, well, her right. husband's a bully and her husband says this. You know what? She's leading by example. She's not identifying and catering to the bullies that criticize her for, for right. really no good reason other than the fact that they don't like her husband. Absolutely. I could not agree more with you. And I did love Michelle Obama. She was so much fun. And when she'd go on The Tonight Show and Jimmy Fallon, God, those were just classic. And they'll be around forever. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. And I have to say, I love Barbara Bush's sense of humor. Barbara Bush, she would just, you'd you'd think she's being real serious. And then all of a sudden, she would just crack up because he would say something to her. You know, the president would say something to her, and the two of them would just giggle like little kids. But they had that their whole lives. I mean, I think they had that sense of humor. That whole family does. Um, even 100%. the kids. Yeah, you and know, they were John, so, I'll, so much I'll fun say, to watch. I'll say, I'll say something on your show here that I've never said before in the history Ooh, of First Ladies, man. Barbara okay. Bush, as I listen to your comments and know what I know about Barbara Bush, Barbara Bush is probably the most well-rounded first lady of all time. Yeah, I I have to agree with you. She ran that 
family political dynasty with an iron fist. You did not cross her, and any of her grandchildren will tell you that. Any of her children will tell you that. Secret Service will tell you that. Yet, for everyone I know that's been in multiple uh, administrations, and that goes for pastry chefs to Secret Service to administration people to pilots of Air Force One, hands down, nine out of ten times when you ask them who their favorite president and first lady, it's George H.W. Bush and Barbara Bush. And we have to remember – These are the people that see them at their most real. They see them at their best moments and their worst moments. They see them when they love, they laugh, they cry, they win, they lose. They see the human side of these people because the people that work in the White House for multiple administrations are loyal to the position and the place, not the party. Right. Their opinion really has to be taken with that gravity and with that weight. And, 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 And all those things that you mentioned. Of, of her laughing and cracking jokes, and you would, do, you would see interviews late in, in life where, where the whole family's crying, and Barbara Bush is saying, oh, come on, bunch of sissies, get it, get it together. Why is everyone crying this? And, and I, can, I can tell you this. She said she made news. She made groundbreaking news during our C-SPAN series when uh, she said about the election, and this is before her son uh, uh, hopped into the, the, to the um, – to the uh, 2016 election, she said, I would think that there would be someone out there whose last name isn't Bush and isn't Clinton that can step up to the plate and take over here. You know, yes. I mean, think about what that woman had to go through. Her son, two of her sons and her husband, both high ranking. I mean, you know, George H.W. and George W., the highest ranking, but her, 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 her you know, Jeb was was a governor of, of a large and, and important state that went through its own controversies and, and, and issues and problems, to sit back and hear what people say and think about people that you've given birth to, people that you love, people that you've married. I mean, if these, if these critics and these people were to, were to have anyone say the things about their family that they say about these people, they, they might change their tune a little bit, you know? And, and I'm not Pollyannish about it. I understand they're the president and first lady of the United States. And, and, and a certain amount of that is needed and necessary, and, and, and it's, just, it's just the way you do it. I think people can be a little more respectful about it. But Barbara Bush, you, you, you nailed it. I mean, like sense, sense of humor. She said she – was, she was said openly on, – on, this was another 60 Minutes interview. Someone asked her – I forget who the reporter was – but said, you know, a lot of people say that you're not very attractive. Or you, I, I, I forget oh, no. exactly how he put it, but it was, it was, not, a, it was not a nice – it was asking her to respond to her critics. And she, her response was, without a blink, she said, I'm a fine-looking woman. I just don't dress very well. I mean, she just <laughs> – she got it. She didn't, even with all of the seriousness, all of the public service, all of everything she had to do for that political dynasty, that together, to be that strong matriarch and be that military wife and be the mother of so many different children that got in so many different situations of public life, she still had a sense of humor and didn't take herself too seriously and selfless. Her philanthropies and her post-White House work with literacy and children's health, I know from personal experiences, was tireless tireless up until the day that she died. And, and there's another thing. We didn't even really know she was sick. We knew she was old. But, but, right. but when it yep. was announced, you know, I mean, we heard a lot about uh, President H.W. Bush going in and out of the hospital, and she, would, we, she wheeled him out in his wheelchair to get with the Golden Knights to jump out of planes on his birthday into his 90s. I mean, this is a remarkable <laughs> couple. Take, take politics they the are. They were, out of it. yeah. Amazing, amazing couple. Yeah. And you look at their story, the so book that's within that's itself, too. Oh, for sure, for sure. So, what's next for you? What do you have coming up? Uh, you have the two books. What's coming up for you? Anything big? Well, m- more, 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 more first ladies. Bigger, better first ladies. I- I've got so many different ideas for, for offshoot projects of this, television shows of my own. Uh, uh, online college classes, uh, both for credit and just for people looking to, to learn a little bit of, of, of history. There's women's uh, leadership courses that can be taken with the historical relevance to this. But keep in mind, even though I've done the heavy lifting at this point in that the C-SPAN series is done, volume one is do- being done, volume two is being done. When I was at Montpelier in Orange, Virginia for Dolly Madison, they were still digging up and finding things 
on the property, finding out new things about one of the most well-known and celebrated first ladies in history. When I was in wow. Springfield, Illinois, we had just uncovered letters that Robert Lincoln wrote about his mother's institutionalization when she went uh, a, a, little, a little batty uh, in, in Chicago because she was self-medicating out of depression and things like that. Dolly Madison and Mary Lincoln. We're still finding out new things about those women, new things that the C-SPAN series brought to light, new things that my books are bringing to light, but we were finding those things out in 2013. The Obamas haven't gotten their library yet. That doesn't open until 2020. For uh, Rosalind Carter, I went to Plains, Georgia, to find out about her and Jimmy's early childhood together. That's, that's one couple there, the, the Carters. It's almost impossible to talk about one without the other. And, and they've been married, I think it's 72 years this past July. The wow. Bushes hold the record <laughs> at 74 years married. Mm-hmm. And the Carters are still going very, very strong. So, you know, God knows what they could accomplish. Another remarkably uh, uh, prolific and, and productive post-White House career for the Carters. And many would argue even more productive than, than their time in the White House. Um, So there's still so much to learn. And then keep in mind that we make a new first lady every four to eight years. So this project can go as long as I want it to go because we're never tired of looking at history and we're creating more history and more first ladies on a regular basis. So I can be the first ladies man forever. Well, we hope you will be, and I'm excited because you and I just spoke a little bit ago about you coming back on and having some of our listeners call in, and of course, we're world, worldwide, and I want to say thank you to our listeners in Australia because that listenership just popped up really, really heavily over the last month, and we're really excited to have Australia and New Zealand on board with us now, so uh, just just a fun radio show, and can't wait to have you back again, and uh, people can go to firstladiesman.com. You can order the books, you can get t-shirts, and you can see what's going on and check out some of his videos. Andy, thank you so much. I can't wait to have you back again. This has been a blast. Donna, I'll come back any and every time. You've got a wonderful show. I love the military ties and your your love of America and politics and and all the things that I've been talking about. I I appreciate you and people like you and the shows that have me on. It takes a village, like Hillary Clinton said, and, 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 and I truly believe that, and you're part of the First Ladies Man Village now, and I'll come back any and every time you want me. Well, I am honored. Thank you so much, and you have a great rest of your day. You do the same. Bye, Andy. Everyone, that's Andy Oak, and you can check him out on firstladiesman.com. Please go to the website, order the books, because they're fascinating. I can't wait to have him back on again. I want to thank listeners around both states and all this in Chile, France, Italy. Thank you so much. Next time. Thank